from the ground up and we're talking with John John Lomachinsky. Like? Lomachinsky who we found in Woodstock at the farmers market and we want to talk with him because he's doing the right thing as far as raising animals in their natural environment so um, John tell us tell us what you're doing and where you are well we are located in Baltimore Vermont my wife Becky and I run Springmore farm we raise animals out on pasture the way they should be raised. Uh, currently we have pigs, chickens, both layers and meat birds, and we raise turkeys as well. We're starting to expand with uh, organic vegetables. But with our animals, um, the pigs are free to root around. We actually use them to till our garden in the wow. springtime. We try to wow. use as little fossil fuels as possible so we, we put the pigs to work. They till up the garden, uh, fertilize and eat it um, and then we continue to move them to fresh pasture all the time. Uh, we have a brushy area on the farm that was probably pasture about 15 or 20 years ago and it's starting to get a little overgrown and that's where the pigs spend most of the summer because it's nice and shady over there. They're able to wallow in the mud, um, stay cool, just be pigs. Yeah, yeah. So some of the things that we're talking about is how we are uh, spirits having human uh, experiences, and pigs are, are spirits having pig experiences. And have you, uh, people say that pigs are actually far more personable and smart than, than people give them credit for. Oh, tell, tell us about Definitely. Uh, pigs, each pig that we have has their own personality. They're extremely intelligent, very friendly. Um, they are always testing the electric fence. And <laughs> you want to make sure that's on because if it's off, they will get out. But yeah, they come and greet us whenever they see us. We, we see them multiple times a day. We love having visitors to the farm and they love seeing new people. Uh, we have one pig who loves to get her belly rubbed. She's like a dog. <laughs> we go in there and she just flops down and we just scratch her stomach. Um, we have some one right now we call her trouble because she's always trying to eat our boots no matter what. She's, <laughs> She's uh, the troublemaker of the bunch. So what led you to get into this business? Was it ethics or was it... Uh... Well, it started after my wife and I threw hike the Appalachian Trail in 2004. And during that time, we realized that you don't need much to live. Uh, we were living in the woods for five and a half months and carrying everything that we needed on our back. And we realized that food was key, and at that point, we were trying to consume as many calories as possible just to be able to go on. And that's when we really started to realize that food is, is key to your existence, and not just you know, food that you find at the grocery store, because most of that is not food. You really shouldn't consume it. They call it food, but right. it, it shouldn't be consumed. Right. And we thought that the best way to uh, get our own food was to raise it ourselves. And we started small, just planting the garden, raising a handful of chickens, a couple of pigs, and we slowly expanded. And we wanted to do it right, so everything on our farm is portable. Um, the way we move the chickens, the way we move the pigs, so we experimented with different methods and it's an ongoing process just trying to continuously improve what we do both for the animals and for the land the pasture john i was going to say something that um it's very self-sustaining your um do you want to say it on your, kevin your uh methods are very self-sustaining mm -hmm. the, the pigs till the soil you were saying yes. so you don't have to 
you know, do another process and, and do it artificially. It's done all naturally. Right. Yep. And, and even with our field, we have um, farmers next to us on both sides of us, and they do not run any animals on their pasture. They fertilize it at least once a year and just hay it. Our fields have no artificial fertilizer. We just run the animals on it. Our fields green up first in the springtime wow. and stay green until wow. the snow covers them, where our neighbors' fields who spend the time and money fertilizing them, as soon as it starts to get a little cold, their fields start to turn brown. Wow. So the proof is right there. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to add something on this point, is that now they're starting to realize that the, that the agricultural um, uh, community, I guess, that the, um, the, the bacteria that comes from the, um, animals? The, the, the waste of the animals is actually uh, retains moisture in the soil and it, it just it, 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 it looks after itself. You don't have to add anything to it. It becomes alive and it's synergistic because the bacteria makes it like that. Nature has always provided for that. Exactly. We our next animal on the farm, in a few weeks we're getting a few cows and that'll work perfect with our system. It'll sort of mimic nature where the birds would follow the great herds in the, in the Midwest. So we'll have the cows, they'll eat the grass, um, make it a little lower, more manageable, more manageable for the birds, mm -hmm. and then we'll have the chickens come in afterwards They'll scrape the cow patties, eat any of the insects that are starting to grow, clean up the fields, and then provide the nitrogen because the chicken manure is high in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And then we just always keep an eye on what the pasture can handle. If we realize that it's starting to... You can base it on the weather. If it's dry and the grass is not that great, we can hold off. We won't run as many animals, but if the pasture can handle it, then we'll be able to put more animals there. So nice. it's the pasture, the land, that tells us what we oh, can do. It's the soil. It's the soil. Yeah. It's the soil. Yeah. It's the soil. Yeah. And the soul. Yeah. And look, there's a picture of your animals there. I don't, just, I don't know if we can see Loving them. the grass. Yeah. And loving um, being on the grass where nature intended. Uh, may, I, may I touch on a, maybe a touchy subject? Sure. <laughs> uh, we, we just passed a bill. Um, uh, I think it was passed. Do you want to do it? Uh, we passed a bill uh, for on farm slaughter. Yes. No, I think you should be close because of the sound, huh? Okay. Uh, so come up close to him. <laughs> He's eye candy. <laughs> she just doesn't want me to film her. <laughs> so, uh, and so does that pertain to your practices? Well, right now we are allowed to process 1,000 chickens on farm without being inspected. If we do more than 1,000, they have to go USDA. And with the chickens, we can only sell them whole, which is unfortunate because a lot of people are looking for pieces. So we definitely lose a lot of customers. A thousand sounds like a lot of birds, but in actuality, it's not that many. Um, the big processing plants do a thousand in probably a couple of hours. We know all of our customers that come to the right, farm. Right, right. So if you, and they know each other. They do. So what, what, what many people who are, many people who are frightened about uh, not having the USDA inspection uh, also don't know that any one bad bird would mean that you would lose business. It's, uh, it's knowing your, your person directly. And it's um, so inhumane what these large farms do. So knowing that your animals that you're, you're consuming have had humane and honorable treatment is um, a huge step forward. And I'm hoping our viewers will, will uh, go in that direction and know that one chicken a week, in, week rather than one every night that has been treated uh, without cruelty means that you're eating an animal that is is uh, has been treated as a as a human would do another creature of, of the earth. So that we is, share it with. Yep. So I'm going to. Anything else you would like to add? Well, even though we raise meat, we think that most Americans eat way too much meat in their diet, and mm -hmm. we encourage people to 
instead of eating a large portion of meat at every meal, have smaller, high-quality meat. Um, buy locally. Get to know your farmer. There's plenty of great farmers in Vermont that raise all sorts of meat, beef, pork, eggs, lamb, and you don't need to eat as much. And people think it's more expensive, but the true cost of the supermarket meat, people don't see that. The chemicals, and when you're, when you're uh, eating the, the, the cows that have the bovine growth formula, it's affecting yourself, and it's part of, part of the obese problem is the bovine growth form, hormone is what yes. it is. So um, it's, it's our capacity to buy clean food is more important than our vote in some in some respects. So mm -hmm. if you don't like what's happening politically, use your dollars as your vote and buy from your neighbor and know what you're eating. It's a way of, of being free. G GMOs are, are, are you don't eat GMOs if you're eating from the factory, if it, the family farms. I want to say mm -hmm. because they're eating grass, whereas the factory farms are being fed. Uh, grains when they shouldn't be fed grains if they're you know like if they're livestock say and they're not meant to, to eat grains and they they're not just grains they're genetically modified grains yes. so mm -hmm. we don't sure. know what that's going to have what effects down the line for example that's that's meddling with the DNA and we don't know what little children are going to what, what the effects of it in down the road over many years you know cows should not have any grain in their diet they're designed to eat and process grass Chickens and pigs need some grain in their diet, but that should not be their main source. Our chickens are able to get about half, if not a little more, of their diet from the insects and the grass and everything from the pasture. Our pigs get very little grain. We give them a little bit of GMO-free cracked corn, but they get most of their diet from the pasture and from whey. We work wow. with a local cheese manufacturer and we provide our pigs with whey and it makes for a delicious piece of meat. John, would you, would you welcome a visit from us sometime? We would love to, Okay, yes. we'll come up with a big camera. Great. Thank you. Shake his hand, Denise. Shake his hand. Nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you, John. You so much, Thank you. Oh, oh you're sorry, rewarding. I'm just asking Damien, Damien. and Michael mm -hmm. about their trek uh, uh, across. Uh, where are you planning to go? Have you got a plan? Uh, we're starting in, started in Hanover, New Hampshire, and we're going to see how far we could get south in two weeks. So, so Hanover is, is quite north in New Hampshire, is it? It's right, it's across right on the border. Right on okay, the border. Okay, so right over the oh, oh, water, of, well, water of what? Sorry. <laughs> New enough. Hampshire. <laughs> of, uh, Vermont. It's right on the Vermont border. Okay. We actually started heading northbound when we got there, and we had to turn around and I whipped out my compass, and I was like, something's wrong here, you know what I mean? And then we, we got our, Thank you. our bearings right, and now we're heading in the right direction. And how are you traveling? How are you traveling? By what forms of transportation? Um, foot. Mm -hmm. Just walking all day. Yeah. Walking all day. <laughs> You're going to go as far south as you can. Yeah, we'll see how far we can make Push. it. Yep. And uh, you got a time frame? that you want to do this in? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks yeah. Yeah. So have you have you um, done camping before? Yes. I'm actually an Eagle Scout, so I've done a lot of that. <laughs> so have you concerned about the earth? Have you concerns about the earth? Concerns uh, about the uh, earth. Climate change? Uh, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. Leave no trace. Mm -hmm. Zero waste. Leave the world, world a oh. bit better than, it, than you found it kind of thing. Exactly. Yes. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. So we need to make zero waste a sexy thing. That's yes. right. So what can you do towards that? Um, take my pants off. <laughs> that sounds good. I would yeah. pan down, but I feel an like... organic farm on an organic farm. Exactly. And then we can videotape it. Go naked it. Through, the, through the grass. Yeah. We'll show how wonderful it is to just, you know... Be free. Be free. That's what it and is. And natural in nature, you know, with nature, close to it. Yeah. So, so you would actually take your pants off to show zero waste? I would. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to care to give your contact info in case she's going to come fill you? Sure. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we'll get Kathleen It's a new campaign. It's pants off, no it, waste. I couldn't think of anything that yeah. rhymes. I don't know. We'll think of a good, you if, know. You, if you don't want to waste, take off your pants. 
That's it. Well, don't wear it in the first place. I have a t-shirt company, so we could actually, we could work together. Yeah, that's right. We can market this nicely. Right. With a, like a, a fig leaf like at the bottom of mm. the t-shirt, so mm. just a cover. Just Maybe a people long, like to a long to t-shirt would be good, you know what I mean? Because yeah. then you oh. need to get more people to get into yeah. it. Yeah. I, you know? I've got it. Waste free means pants free or waste free from the waist down. Perfect. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I'm right. Emily Payton. Mike. Mike. I'm Denise. Denise. Ward. And we started this Mark, other party. Mike and Damien. And I run in uh, awesome. gubernatorial politics to talk about what industrial hemp can do, what public banking can do, okay. you know, all the things that we need to do. Perfect. Thank you for being on Organic Politics. Thank you. Have happy trails. Yes. <laughs> you just ate it? It's alright. Juice I'll are good for you. He just dropped it and he's still eating it. We've been eating dirt for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It bolsters your immune. Yeah. 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 I'm going to stay I'm rolling because this is teeth. too... <laughs> <laughs> you got to, you know, gritty. So you're concerned about having enough uh, uh, food. Are you ever concerned about what's in the food? I'm the... very concerned about what's in the food. What concerns you? Just the, the quality. Myself, I am a meat eater. I'm not going to lie. I need to eat protein. But at the same time, I do... Uh, put value in vegetables and agriculture but the stock in this country the way we're cultivating right our meat sources is mm -hmm. these huge corporations right is mm -hmm. they're just feeding them all sorts of things feeding them these m23 soybeans or something mm -hmm. and it's just horrible and grains when they're not their system is not meant to digest grains exactly yeah and they, yeah, you're, you're eating unhealthy beef you know what i mean and now an unhappy cow goes into me, and now I'm unhappy, you know what mm -hmm, I mean? I want mm -hmm. a happy cow, mm -hmm. you know? We just got through talking with uh, some of the farmers over there that are raising animals as they should be, mm -hmm. and, and, and particularly pigs, right. the, that are not supposed to eat grains. Right. So it matters. If you, if you value your body, which mm -hmm. is your temple, mm -hmm. you'll value what goes in it. Right. I'm I glad totally to hear agree. you knowing that. I'm so yeah, glad I'm, to hear you seeing that. I get that. flustered. When I hear about this stuff, it's horrible. There's just, and the problem is, in, in my opinion, is that there's just not enough food. I don't, I just, I can't grasp my mind around how we could yes. agriculture, how we could farm, you know, correctly and still feed everyone. That's, oh, so we can't, we haven't even tried to, though. But, right. but you know, the problem, we haven't even tried. You're right. And also, what we do know is that the, the small farms, the small intensive farms, mm -hmm. are three to four times more productive okay. per unit of space. Okay. than the large ones. Mm -hmm. And we know that in Russia, that 65% of their produce, all of it, comes from small, small family farms. Mm -hmm. I was getting your chest. <laughs> it's like a you keep an eye on both. And that, uh, so if we were empowering small farms, we'd have more productivity, higher quality, and we'd have uh, better health. And right. it'd be more humane, you know. In, and with, more with humane, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, who wants to treat animals like that? It's what, horrible. What kind of monsters? I've seen pictures, yeah. The corporations hide most of the footage and the pictures. They, and they're now they're, they'll accuse you of terrorism if you film on their premises. You're right, yeah. And so, it's just, I've seen, it's just patch, it's just wasteland of dirt. And it's a dump, you know what I mean? Yeah, so it goes into the uh, water system. And, and pollutes the water because it's too concentrated, doesn't have enough time to work its way into the soil. They don't even get any soil, probably. As well, the, the, uh, the waste, the methane from the factory farms is much more damaging to the atmosphere. And when it's concentrated like that, it goes into the atmosphere. But would you tell these gentlemen, it's Damien and Michael, Michael about um, billionosis? We're, we're saying that people who need a million, a billion, a trillion dollars suffer from um, billionosis, like always want, never, it's, they're sort of like malcontented and they, they're thinking that it's, it's like a disease, you know, that, that needs uh, treatment. Kind of like a they, megalomania type of thing? Well, right. we're, we're saying that there must be some sort of, uh, you know, like emotional problem that they can't get satisfied because they, first they get a million, that's not enough, then they want a billion, that's not enough, so they want extra billions and it's never enough and they keep wanting to grab more and more and, and they at at, for that want that they have, that, that craving that they have, they will put people in, in, in harm's way, they will put animals in harm's way, and the planet, even their children really, because they're going to be the ones suffering in the future. So we're calling it a disease, like do you think this is Do you think this is a natural disease, or do you think this is a product of culture? Well, let me society? tell you what I think it is personally. I think it's a, it's a disease that comes from a, an economy that's based on profit and greed. Mm -hmm. Now, we are greedy 
beings, but that's not the biggest uh, part of what we are. We're much more than that. Greed is a very small part of what humans are, but we base a whole economy on, on the very small part of what humans are. What if we were to base an economy on, say, pleasure, for example? You know, and anything that gives pleasure is what is uh, what, what where the rewards are directed, you know, not just who can make the most profit. It's just, you know, something to think about. And because it can be done. Right. I, I would say we aren't greedy. I'd say we are hungry. We are hungry people, hungry for a lot of experiences or whatever. But I don't think that greed is natural. But I was going to say that, um, you know, if, if it wasn't for the economy being based on greed, perhaps we wouldn't have as much greed because it makes people who are good need to be kind of greedy because... Um, they have to do it in order to, for example, to that, exactly. They have to work at a job that they yeah. know is doing the wrong thing, but they have to do it because they can't see how they the can get out of it. Because there's no other option. Yeah. There's no other option. But we're looking to make options available to people. Other options. Wouldn't that be fun? And I'm actually working for a, uh, a an online um, currency. So uh, there are people working uh, for uh, new economies. You know uh, that we can have. You. Give more options to the people. No. So, hmm. so, you know, there are ways. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to say thank you guys for being on Organic Politics and From the Ground well, Up. Thank you. Yeah, thank it's you. It's really awesome thank to you. talk to you. Yeah, it's no, really it's great. Awesome. Yeah, we're like minded people. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Can I get a picture with you guys? Maybe sure. uh, yeah. next person that walks by, I'll, I'll get them to take a picture of all of us. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm Emily Payton with Organic Politics from the Ground Up, and I'm speaking. Akamodi. Peter Akamodi, who does this incredible carving stuff. And we found out... Just a quick yeah, peek at yeah, the, yeah. the work. He does uh, Akamodi carving. And we found out we had a common passion about how much injustice is done uh, by an industry, a, the Bar Association, Association industry, the criminal justice industry. And... Uh, what we need to do to reform it is uh, we need to open it up and discuss how we can help it. What are some of the ideas that you think would have been better for you uh, to, to deal with um, actions that, that um, you took as a child? How would you, how would you like it to happen better? And I want you to speak to it as a volunteer. Um. For example, may I speak? Oh, and I, may I speak that uh, when you were 21, you uh, you took some tires. Yeah. And uh, were you ever offered an opportunity to return them? Um, no. And I I basically I was charged. I had to go to trial. Um, I I I pled guilty because I I did take the tires. Um, the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor for me was about five dollars. Um, I spent a good five years or more of my life trying to make up for that. And now I'm a convicted felon because I took tires when I was 21. I found out recently when I wanted to start making up for things that I couldn't join the Moose, I couldn't join the Elks, I couldn't join Shriners, Freemasons, or anything that, any kind of organization that's supposed to like help people in need. And, uh, what you need is a pardon. What I'm wondering is how, how can people who have made a mistake return. make up for it, return the favor? And, and lately it's been crawling underneath people's trailers and, uh, you know, and feces and stuff. And that's not really, I kind of wanted to do more than that. I wanted to actually help people, you know, uh, uh, instead of just cleaning up after them, you know. But um, I, I just, I kind of think that maybe... There should be some changes allowing people to make up for their past. Now, for example, you know? if when that happened, instead of being uh, having the taxpayers pay fifty thousand or whatever it is to put you in jail for a few tires, which are the value of I don't know, a few hundred dollars, yeah. they could have potentially uh, given you a mentor. Yeah. A mentor that would be with you. Or even if they sent me to a work farm where I could work off what I did. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. I mean, they used to have farms where people, if they ran, they were in debt, they would go and they'd work off their debt. 
why isn't there something like that for people who have done a crime where they, they, they took something but they need to make up for it? Why do they have to pay for it for the rest of their lives by not being allowed? To do anything. There's no statute of limitations on that. Yeah, well, I haven't voted, and since I figured that portion of my life was cut off from me, I found other things to do with my time. Mm -hmm. And I'll still pay my taxes with this stuff, you know. Peter, you were saying what you did to bring yourself out of that culture? Is I, I distanced myself from people that had a kind of a ne negative impact on my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I would make a lot of bad decisions. I can't blame them for that. But what I did was I, I found people that would help me make better decisions. You know, and those are the people I would spend time with. And if I spent time with people that would make better decisions with their lives, I would start making better decisions in my life. And my life would start to change. You know, I mean, the people you spend time with do influence mm -hmm. your judgment. That's so. true. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but um, when do you end up paying for the debt? When does it end? Because you did something when you were young. Do you have to pay for it for the rest of your life? Do, and anybody else who, who ha makes a mistake when they're young. I mean, people who... In, who, who, who make mistakes in business and corporations, there's a statute of limit, limitations where you cannot bring anything, to, you know, to, to, to a lawsuit for that. And so they have a, a finish line a you know, where they, they can't be liable. Well, what about if you've made a mistake when you're young? Why do you have to pay for that? Is there no s forever? Why do you have to pay for that forever? Is there no statute of limitations applying to the, yeah. the individual? I don't, I don't know. I'd like to find out. I did talk to a lawyer last year, and he said that in 10 years, if I have a completely clean record, there is a window. No. No. So I guess there is no end. It's just, it's there. What he said is that from the time that you had your conviction, yeah. if you remained clean for 10 years and didn't have any other charges, misdemeanors or anything, then there would be a possibility of it being expunged. expunged. But because you had possession charges after the felony, you're... Yeah. Forget it. You, you know, it's interesting, yeah. though, now that we've de decriminalized, decriminalized it. Then, we, then we need to address the, the wrongs that happened before. Yeah. Every time I'm interviewed, you know, I mean, that comes up. And because I took That's tires when I was 21, that says I can't work for you today. <laughs> So what's going to be, what about our website? What's going to happen on it? Well, the key is, is that if we can build a website that uh, allows people to join the other party right on the website, get their name, their phone number, and their address, then, uh, then we can build uh, followers here in Vermont, and that's how we can build the base of this party. And once, once we have a, a nice base, then we can go in there and, uh, and take over their, all the offices in the state of Vermont. Why should we join the other party? You should join the other party because every other party is utterly ridiculous. <laughs> and the other reason why you want to join the other party is because it's, it's time to drop the old paradigm and form something new. The old paradigm being Democrat and Republican, and even independent. So, so now we're going to shed that, and we're going to birth a new party, a new way of thinking, a new attitude, and a new lifestyle. The other party. It's really what you're about. You just don't know it about yet. <laughs> Hello. You taking motion? Motion. Oh. How does it feel to be a multiple? It feels a little clumsy, but fine. <laughs> They're all ladies, don't there's some men? Pardon? There's some men too, yeah. That's wonderful. We're all ladies. <laughs> to the core, we're ladies. <laughs> oh, that's so marvelous.